Mr. Armkey back with you for CTS 120. Uh, we are here today for Chapter 5, Supporting Hard Drives and Other Storage Devices. Our objectives for today are to talk about technologies used inside of a hard drive and how a computer communicates with that hard drive. We're going to look at how to select, uh, install and support a, uh, a hard disk, how to identify tape drives and tape cartridges, magnetic tape, how to support optical drives, solid state storage, and flash memory. We're also going to look at a little bit of troubleshooting. So, as we talked about in class, uh, the, the slides that are titled with uh, either yellow or orange bars, uh, something that's distinct from the standard color scheme of the, the uh, presentation, is representative of something that's more so for illustrative context. So this may help aid your understanding. The first commercial hard drive was back in 1956, used as part of what's called the RAMAC 305, Random Access Method of Accounting and Control. Prior to that, everything was stored on linear storage. So magnetic tape, which we'll talk about later on, was the primary method of trying to store items uh, rather than using a platter-based system, which allowed you to move back and forth very rapidly between data tracks. Rapidly, of course, being a relative term. This was 50 24-inch platters that stored five megabytes. Um, the footprint was larger than two refrigerators. So if you, if you take a look there in the, uh, the graphic, you'll see that these are the Model 350 clusters. In 1956, this cost nearly $50,000, and in 2016 for inflation would adjust to almost half a million. Here we have one of the RAMAC storage disks. You can see the, uh, the track system there. This stores 5 million alphanumeric characters. So that's where we get the original megabyte. Six data bits, one parity bit, and one space bit created the standard 8-bit binary storage block. A hard disk drive is traditionally rated by five uh, metrics. Its physical size or form factor, its capacity, its speed, the technologies used inside the drive, as well as the interface standards that connect it to the computer. Two types of hardware technologies that are used inside of most drives now are magnetic and solid state. Magnetic drives have multiple platters stacked together, spinning in unison inside of a sealed metal housing. The firmware on the logic control board controls the data read, write, and motherboard communication. The read write heads are controlled by a, uh, a magnetic actuator that pivots an arm back and forth. Data is organized in concentric circles called tracks, and these tracks are perpendicularly divided into segments called sectors. Most current drives use sectors that are about four kilobytes in size. Form factors for internal magnetic hard drives tend to be three and a half inches for desktops and two and a half inches for laptops. So here we see a graphic on the right of a, an older five and a quarter inch on the far left, three and a half, which is the standard in the middle, uh, two and a half to the right of that, and 1.8, which we would see for low end laptops and devices such as the classic iPod on the far right. So here we can see the inside of a magnetic drive, kind of a quick zoom in. You can see the center drive spindle, the, uh, the mount plates to hold that, uh, those platters anchored there, and those are readable top and bottom. So for each of the, uh, each of the, uh, the spindles uh, plates, there will be one read-write head per face. The read-write head will be top and bottom, so there's actually um, three of them that are active for data reading. And the very bottom of the bottom platter is actually the, um, the what's the topography for our low-level formatting. And here's a laptop hard drive next to a magnetic hard drive, just so you can see the difference in thickness, not just in width. Uh, by comparison, you can see a number two pencil on the far right. Now, there are combinations. This is what we call a solid-state hybrid drive. This combines the technology that allows solid states to achieve very um, efficient speed as well as efficient cost and long-term storage for a magnetic disk. Solid state acts as a caching volume, which uses temporarily um, stored files that are constantly used in the solid state drive itself. So very much like transferring information from the hard drive to the RAM is a temporary form of volatile storage. We do the same thing with the SSD, except the SSD, of course, is non-volatile. Now, the operating system does have to support the technology, but it has a longer uh, mean time between failures. That's the MTBF you see there. And it also includes a power saving of up to 90% when the main spin of the uh, magnetic disk is powered down.
This is because the solid state drive does not require constant spinning in order to retrieve information. Now we're going to take a look at logical operators, and I'm going to do this kind of quickly. This is something that you may or may not have seen before. Whenever we construct circuits, we have to be able to process information in such a way as to produce different results. So we use these operators to construct logic circuits. Logical operators will require the comparison of two operands, either a 0 or a 1, because we're working in a binary environment. So if we're looking at something like an AND, this is what we call a conjunction. This requires both components to be true to resolve as true. So in order to make the entire statement true, we have to have a true and true subcomponent. For an OR, a disjunction, this requires that at least one component be true rather than both meaning that while 1, 1 would still work, just as it would with an AND, we can also use 0, 1, or 1, 0. The third is what we call the XOR, or exclusive OR. The exclusive OR is what we also call an exclusive disjunction, which is one or the other, but not both. This requires that only one component be true to resolve as true. So we cannot have matching truths uh, on either side. So we can't have 1, 1, but we can't have 1, 0, or 0, 1. On the other side, we have what are called the not modified operators. Not and, not or, and the exclusive nor, or not or. Not and is the inverse of an and, meaning that instead of resolving true for 1, 1, it resolves for everything that is not 1, 1. So it's the logical complement. The logical complement basically means all possible options uh, are going to be the result of the two working together. So if we have four possible options, double zero, double one, one zero, or zero one, all four of those options should be represented by each operator and its complement. With not or, we're gonna take the inverse of the, um, the or, so instead of one one, one zero, and zero one, we only have the double zero. X nor is the logical complement of X or, so instead of saying one or the other but not both, we now say that both components must be equal to one another. So a double false or a double true. So here we can see a representation of NAND versus NOR. NAND gives a value of true if and only if one proposition is false, and not OR gives a value of true if and only if both propositions are false. If we look at the truth tables here, we can see the comparison. Uh, something that you'll notice is the retaining of a one bit um, in the event of a potential failure is going to happen 75% out of 100. Um, so the likelihood is, is that you won't lose data in the event of a failure. You're not going to create a bit where it might otherwise not be. The ones that we're really concerned about are rows 2 and 3. It's also much cheaper to create a NAND circuit because it can be wired in series rather than uh, in parallel. We talked about magnetic, now let's talk about solid state. Solid state devices are named as such because they have no moving parts. They're built using non-volatile memory, similar to a flash drive, um, based on a more permanent form of storage uh, than what we would see with RAM, but not requiring the platters that we would see for a magnetic disk. The memory in an SSD is traditionally called NAND flash memory, which we were just talking about in the primer section. The lifespan of these drives is based on the number of write operations performed. This is expressed as terabytes written, or TBW or DWPD, drive writes per day. Drive writes per day tends to be a little bit more of an average, whereas terabytes written uh, gives us more of an actual lifespan. Now, if we have a large number of drive writes being done in a single day, uh, obviously that average will shift very little overall um, if it's traditionally a low amount, but terabytes written will reflect that larger value as an acceleration towards a potential failure point. Solid state drives are more expensive but they are much more reliable, they last longer, they're much faster, and they use a lot less power. Uh, again, we have a lot of limitations because we have a mechanical device that actually spins up the drive and moves the actuator to read data. There are three popular form factors that are currently used by solid state drives. The two and a half drive that we're used to seeing with laptops, the M2 SSD card, and the PCI Express SSD expansion card. Now, when we're dealing with solid state drives, something we have to be aware of is how garbage collection is handled. Garbage collection is going to be familiar to all of my programming students, but in general, what you see is these blocks that are made up of pages. So, individual pages are where pieces of a particular file can be written. 
a block is made up of several pages. In this case, they're going to give us an example of 12. Now, individual pages can be written at any time if they are currently free. So as we write information, we can do uh, X, Y, or Z. If we have to update information, however, we have to be aware of data becoming stale or invalid. Now, we can't overwrite this data because that's not how the writing process works. Uh, we're going to have to instead erase the entire block and start writing again. But we don't want to lose the data that's already there. So if we have A through D, it goes stale. We now have the um, A through D updated versions as well as E through H, secondary block. We're now going to have to copy that from block X to block Y and then erase block X to make it free for writing again. So that process means that the write operations are going to cause an electrical pulse to have to be read through the entire block of information. These blocks uh, and pages thereof are made of the intersections of capacitors. There's a logic gate formed at the intersection of these capacitors. They lose their ability to retain a solid one or zero value over time, attenuating to somewhere around 0.25 to 0.4. Uh, so it wouldn't exactly register a full uh, one or zero. So eventually you have what's called bit rot, where you lose the ability to maintain a consistent differentiation between a zero and a one. Now, don't panic, because current tests project over 750 terabytes uh, of information being presentable. So if you actually open this up in your lecture slides, you'll be able to uh, click on this orange link where it says current tests. It's a uh, listing from techreport.com that shows the SSD endurance experiment. Um, 750 trillion write operations is what most will currently run at. Some have exceeded two petabytes, which is a quadrillion write operations. Um, and again, we have to think about this in terms of scale. You know, a billion is a thousand million. Uh, a trillion is a thousand billion and a quadrillion is a thousand trillion. So it becomes a massive amount of potential operations. Given conventional use, a lifespan for a certain drive could be expected to reach a thousand years. Obviously at that point, we would probably have other things that would start impinging upon its functionality, but uh, that's not to say that it's a guaranteed thing. Just like anything else, they can die a little bit early depending on usage. So here we see solid state drives in comparison to the same pencil from earlier. You can see that the 2.5 they use here is much thinner and then the NVMe and M2s are even thinner uh, than the solid state. Now, in order to store information, we have to create what's called logical block addressing, and this is done by using low-level and high-level formatting. Low-level formatting is where the markings for where the sectors operate on a disk are written to the hard drive at the factory. Now, this is a little bit different. The description I'm about to give is a little bit different than what we would do for solid state. Um, so bear in mind that, that is, this is, we're talking about magnetic disks here. Low-level formatting sets out the logical topology of where all of the track and sector differentiations are made. Now, this is not the same as the high-level formatting performed when we install an operating system. That's called adding a file system um, to the OS, allowing us to organize and retrieve as well as store uh, data. Firmware, BIOS, UEFI, and the OS all use logical block addressing to address all hard drive sectors to be able to quickly move from one to the next so that it's mathematically predictable to move from one position to the other and be able to retrieve the correct data. The size of each block, as well as the total number of blocks, determine the drive's capacity. So if we take all of the tracks and we know how many divisions we have and we know how many sectors that we have created and we know the size of the sector, then we can build a projection of what the drive capacity could be. Self-monitoring analysis and reporting technology, also called SMART. It's used to predict when a drive is likely to fail based on performance metrics. It's going to look for the spin-up time, the distance between the head and the disk, the temperature, and other mechanical activities. If SMART suspects a drive failure is about to happen, it will pop up a warning message. Um, you can disable this if you wish in UEFI. I don't recommend it. I will also say that SMART doesn't always catch when a potential issue is going to come about. Now there are four interface standards traditionally used by hard drives that you're expected to be aware of. The first two are outdated, but because of legacy support, we do have to talk about them. IDE, also known as Parallel ATA or PETA, um, was one of the first hard drive standards that we used for personal computers. It allowed you to have one or two IDE connectors on a motherboard using a 40-pin data cable. 
and then they brought in an, a newer cable a little bit later on that had the same 40 pin connector but 80 thinner wires. The maximum recommended cable length for this was 18 inches. So it didn't mean that you could use a, a whole lot of stuff here. And each cable traditionally only allowed you to connect two drives. So once you went beyond four drives, you were kind of done. You needed a new machine. Now at that time, uh, it wasn't really necessary to go beyond that. Even if you were relatively advanced and you had an optical drive um, as well as an internal uh, hard drive and a, and a floppy drive, you still had one left over. So it meant that you were uh, able to do quite a bit of information exchange. So we can see here the, uh, the 80 and 40 conductor cables. You can see the lines are much finer on the cable on the right. SCSI, Small Computer System Interface, uh, was also a hard drive interface that has now been deprecated. It's used for high-end workstations. You were able to do what was called daisy chaining by supporting uh, multiple devices in the same system. They would be able to use one cable to connect back to a single host adapter to connect up to seven or even 15 SCSI compliant devices in a system. If you'll notice, these are all one less than a power of two, either eight or 16, uh, allowing us to connect devices um, while still retaining one interrupt for the control hub. So here we can see an internal SCSI ribbon cable um, you can see at least one, two, three, four, five connectors to be able to hook up various devices. And I would not be surprised if there was another one or two that was sitting just outside of the frame. Now SATA, which is the one we traditionally use for all of our modern connections uh, for standard hard drives, is going to be defined by an organization called the SATA IO, so the Serial ATA International Organization. This group has oversight of the T13 committee, which maintains SATA standards and definitions for the types of cables, connectors, and data transfer speeds. SATA uses a serial data path, that's what the S in SATA stands for, and a SATA data cable can accommodate a single SATA drive. The power cables, however, can be split, though it's not recommended that you do this extensively as it may perform uh, some erratic operations. SATA comes in three traditional flavors, SATA 3, which goes at speeds up to 6 gigabits, SATA 2 add up to 3, and SATA 1 add up to 1.5. Traditionally, what I recommend is just paying attention to SATA 1, because as you notice, as you go up the tiers, the speed doubles each time. SATA standards are used by all drive types, so that it can be uh, optical drives, even there's some um, kind of hybridish um, floppy drives that I saw come out very near the uh, the end of the lifespan, and I'm sure there have been some that are a little bit retro to try and convert older materials. Um, there are also drive bays, things like that. SATA standards support what's called hot swapping or hot plugging. This is where you can connect or disconnect a drive while a system is running. Now, I don't recommend doing this with your Windows drive, but you can certainly do it with a um, device that's giving you a problem. So let's say you have an optical drive that's uh, getting jammed. Well, if you were to unplug it and replug it, it might reset the internal drive motors and allow you to open the tray rather than having to use the uh, the old close uh, not close pin the old uh, paper clip trick. There's usually a little hole just below the tray that allows you to pop the drive open manually. So you connect to one internal SATA connector on the motherboard via a seven pin data cable and a 15 pin SATA power connector to the power supply. Now a motherboard may have two four or even six SATA connectors. Some of the more extensive ones will have a uh, eight or 10. I haven't seen 10 on a motherboard in quite some time that wasn't built for a server. Um, I actually have a system at home where I have a controller card that I bought that has uh, an additional four ports. Now they recommend that you use connectors in the order recommended in the motherboard's user guide. Um, but again, a lot of the time, just due to the nature of SATA standards, they're pretty stable regardless of what order you put them in. Now here again is the uh, the table that refers to the different data speeds. Uh, so as of revision three, as I said, we're up to six gigabits per second. Here we can see a SATA cable connected to a motherboard uh, via the uh, the yellow connector we see there connecting to the uh, hard drive. And here we can see a comparison between the data and power cables. If you look closely, you can see that there's a little vertical notch. Uh, and that lines up with a vertical tab on the drive itself. This is to make sure that not only you don't put the drive in upside down, uh, but you know that it faces to a particular direction left to right. So you can put it in uh, maybe in a tighter space where you have to angle the cable away from where you can directly see the connector. 
Now SATA 3.2 allows for PCI Express and SATA to work together in a technology called SATA Express. Now SATA Express is not as fast as NVMe. It does use a new connector, um, but it does provide some additional speeds. It can actually enhance some of the, the hybrid drives we talked about before. We can also provide what are called eSATA ports, uh, external SATA, for external drives. eSATA uses a special external shielded cable that's up to two meters long, and it has to be shielded because, of course, it's going to be outside the case, so there's a lot more potential for interference. When we're purchasing a SATA drive, we want to make sure that the standards that we're going to use, as well as the standards on the motherboard, match. If they do not match, the system will run at the slower of the two speeds. So if we have a drive that runs at SATA 3 and a motherboard that runs at SATA 2, it's going to run at SATA 2 speeds. Unless, of course, we purchase a controller card that can attach via PCI Express that allows us access to the SATA 3 functions. NVMe, Non-Volatile Memory Express, is used only by SSDs at present. Now, by comparison, the common SATA standard that we were talking about before, SATA 3, runs at 6 gigabits per second. The most common PCI standard, PCI Express 3.0, transfers at 32 gigabits per second. So NVMe is able to use that speed significantly faster um, by, by five and a third. Now, PCI Express NVMe might be used in three separate ways. A PCI Express expansion card, a U2 slot, or an M2 slot. So here we can see an, a U2 port on the motherboard, a uh, specific connector there. This is a two and a half inch uh, solid state drive. And then here we have a bootable RAID array card uh, from ASUS. Now this is a PCI X16 interface. This is a full-size card. It has its own chipset as well as a controller uh, fan, a heat sink cover, and an activity switch. Uh, so you can go ahead and identify which drive is currently active. You can adjust the fan uh, internally. And you can see that there are four holes making four rows. And these are, if you look towards the right-hand side near the fan, kind of where these little uh, attachment points are. That's where the actual port is. And the holes are where the screw at the end of the card is clipped in. So there are cards of various lengths. You can have what's called a 2242, 2250, 2280, or a 2211. I don't know why they have the uh, 2280 and 2211 blurred together. Now the evolution of data storage is something that I'm sure we're all familiar with. If we were to look back at the old 8-inch floppies that were released in 1971, and we wanted to buy a gigabyte of storage, which at the time would have been a preposterous amount, it would have taken about $1,300. Now if we move forward only 10 years, the CD would allow us to purchase a gigabyte's worth of storage for about $375. Now when we move up to uh, 20 years after that with USB, we cut that in half to about $1.65. 2010, only 10 years further, we're able to cut that down again by another dollar, make it about 65 cents a gig. And now with cloud storage, released around the same time as micro SD, uh, if you have less than 50 gigs worth of storage going on, you probably have it for free. So if you go through OneDrive or Dropbox or iCloud or anything like that, they usually are able to give you a fair amount of storage um, for very little. Now, what about comparative um, storage? Would 100 floppy disks make up a micro SD card? Of course not. 100 floppies at 1.44 each would only be 144 megs, which would be less than one sixth uh, what you'd need to make a gig. So how would it fit up? If we have the average human male standing five feet, 10 inches next to a stack of floppy disks to store seven minutes of HD video, we would need 711 floppy disks standing roughly seven feet tall. What about a terabyte? Well, that would take 728,177 floppies. Uh, 2,000 hours of CD quality audio standing 7,167 feet, over twice as tall as the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. Let's get ridiculous with it. What about a Yottabyte? This covers somewhere around eight quadrillion floppy disks, or eight quadrillion, uh, six trillion, 399,305,555,555 floppy disks. A yottabyte of storage is beyond uh, a terabyte by a factor of one trillion. So a terabyte, uh, petabyte, exabyte, and then yottabyte. To store one yottabyte of data, you'd need a data center as big as Rhode Island and Delaware combined. The stack would go 24 billion kilometers stretching past Pluto. And for those of you who study astronomy, you have to be well aware Pluto is a very, very far reach from the edge of our solar system to us. 
Now let's talk about how we select and install hard drives. Our topics here are going to be how to select a hard drive um, just straight up, uh, our installation details, how to fit a drive in a bay that's too wide, how to set up special considerations for a hard drive and a laptop, and setting up a RAID system. Now the motherboard has to meet the same interface standard as the drive. You can always check the motherboard manual or some online specs to figure that out. SATA ports are also sometimes color-coded to indicate which standard the port supports. M2 slots may support PCI Express 3.0, 2.0, SATA 2, SATA 3, or USB 3.0. When an M2 port with a card installed is using the SATA bus, it's possible that one of the SATA ports is disabled to support it. NVMe expansion cards most likely will use a PCI Express X4 version 3 slot. Now we also have to consider what type of technology is present, its form factor, capacity, transfer rate um, for a magnetic drive, the spindle speed, and for a hybrid drive, the cache or buffer size. And that's not too far off for a solid state drive either. Usually the cache or transitional space also affects our performance. So here are some different publishers or, or creators of, of hard disks that you may want to talk to. Toshiba, Western Digital, Seagate, Samsung, and Kingston. Now, to install a SATA drive, I won't really bore you with it. I'll try and kind of gloss over it quickly. Um, you've already done this when you did your first lab. Now, SATA drives may have jumpers. This is fairly uh, uncommon, though, in my experience. Um, if there are jumpers, though, they're probably already set as they should be. Some older SATA drives may have a Molex power connector in addition to SATA. Only use one. If you use both at the same time, it'll cook the drive. So here we can see our, our, our lineups there. So we can see the jumper block on the far right, SATA data to the left of that, and SATA power to the left of that. Now, of course, we need to follow our steps. Um, you know, when we're doing troubleshooting, anything like that, we need to have our, our planning. So let's go ahead and establish some steps for a hard drive. Step one, as best you can, protect the data. Back up what you can and verify you can access it. Step two, know your starting point. Is everything working? If you're starting with a system that already has issues, you're going to have a much longer road ahead than if everything's working and all you're doing is swapping out a hard drive or adding one to an existing system. Step three, read your documentation and prep your work area. Read and visualize all of your steps and protect against electrostatic discharge. Also make sure that you're handling the drive as well as the interface controls carefully. You know, don't touch any exposed circuitry on the motherboard or on the drive itself. Prevent other people from touching any exposed microchips. Make sure you stay grounded. Use an anti-static bracelet where possible. If you do have to place the drive down, make sure you place it component side up. Do not place the drive on the computer case or on a metal table. Anything that could cause conduction that could cause a short. Step four, of course, is to install the drive. Once the computer shut down, make sure you drain it. Uh, select which bay is going to hold the drive. Slide it in place and secure it. We'll talk about how to make sure that we can secure it effectively in just a moment when the drive is slightly smaller than the bay in which you wish to place it. Correct motherboard SATA connector will need to be attached. Um, a 15-pin SATA power or 4-pin Molex power will need to be connected. And then go ahead and make sure that all your connections and cable management are uh, properly handled. Once that happens, go ahead and power up the system and verify the drive is recognized by your firmware. Here we can see the... Uh, the data cable is already connected on our SATA drive. Now we just have to go ahead and put the power cord into place. So here we see a UEFI setup screen showing a SATA hard drive and DVD drive installed. Now we're ready to boot the hard drive for the first time. If we're using it to install Windows, we're going to go ahead and boot from our media. So if it's network or if it's an optical drive disk or if it's a USB, we're going to need to go ahead and follow the on-screen instructions once we've set up our boot order. If we're installing the second drive as a Windows supplement and there's already an operating system present, go ahead and use the internal disk management utilities to partition and format the second drive. If you're dealing with a removable bay, you're going to uh, pay attention to taking apart the cage by disconnecting its fan, unlocking the pins, sliding it out, inserting the hard drive, anchoring it, and then reversing your steps. If you have a wide bay, you're going to use what's called a universal bay kit or adapter. So here we can see some side brackets that will allow us to fit a drive, in this case a 3.5, uh, into a 5-inch bay. Or if we had a 2.5, maybe we'd use a, a slightly larger piece of metal, slightly wider bracket, in order to fit it in uh, to a 3.5-inch bay. Has been known to happen. So you always want to make sure that you are um, 
not leaving a huge gap because then you will not be supporting the drive correctly and there is possibility that it will slip or otherwise damage it. Um, so you want to make sure that the side brackets connect to the drive and that the other side of said side brackets connect to the mounting bay for your, uh, your computer tower. Now for installing an SSD, we need to make sure that the board supports the type of card that we have. Measure the length of the card, decide which screw hole the uh, card is going to go into. Go ahead and install your standoff so that it lines up correctly. Make sure you slide the card straight into the slot, but not from an upward angle. Uh, anything that sits parallel to the motherboard like that is going to be uh, a temptation to try and angle it in. You don't want to do that because that can damage the connectors. Once the card is slotted, go ahead and install your screw and then make sure that your M2 card is recognized by firmware. Some other guidelines, uh, be aware of manufacturer documentation for drive sizes, form factors, and connector types. Um, that's true for desktops as well as laptops. Make sure that you're aware of voiding any manufacturer warranty. Um, if you're not service center certified, always make the call first. If the old drive is crashed, you'll probably need some recovery media to get Windows back up and running, as well as the drivers. If you're moving from a low capacity drive to a higher capacity one, and most laptops only have one hard drive, you're going to need to consider how you're going to move uh, data from the old drive to the new one. Um, some people will go ahead and install um, a, a what's called an on-the-go cable, OTG cable, uh, in order to transfer from one laptop to another without taking the drives out. Some people will use a, a USB to SATA cable, which they do sell. Rose Will is probably my favorite brand for that. When you're shopping for a laptop drive, make sure we know what not only width, but thickness we are going to need. There are some uh, ultra-thin SSHDs out there, especially from Seagate. Um, they have some, some standard ultra-thins. You know, the uh, brand I think they use is Trista called Momentus. Um, and those will kind of flop about if there's not a pad in place. So make sure you pay attention to what it recommends you use. For a two and a half inch drive, of course, we expect it to use the SATA interface. Some laptops that are high end may also have an M2 SSD. Older lap uh, laptops used to require a lot of disassembly. Newer ones, for the most part, just have a panel you can take off. So, you know, power it down, take out the battery pack and follow your service manual. So make sure that when you remove the plastic cover that you remove the screw um, without damaging it. If it's a plastic screw, have a replacement. Once you've gotten the uh, drive in the bay after you replace it, go ahead and power up the system. And if the drive is new and doesn't have an OS preloaded, you're going to need to install one. So again, uh, Windows set up from a USB drive network source or recovery DVD. Tape drives. This is something you're not going to see quite as often as you go forward, but it is still some of the largest storage uh, for a single unit on Earth. The largest magnetic tape that I currently am aware of is 185 terabytes in size. Now, tape drives tend to use the file system Worm. Write once, read many. The advantage is these are inexpensive. Magnetic tapes are not hard to make. Um, they're also fairly durable as long as they're well taken care of. Now, they're an inexpensive backup method overall, um, but the, the drives themselves tend to be a little bit more pricey. Be aware of that. The data written will not easily be deleted or overwritten because they're written linearly, meaning that you have to start at the beginning and work your way forward. You can't really scan back or forward uh, based on increments. They're good for record keeping because of that. Um, because data is stored and accessed sequentially, you have to start at the beginning and spool forward until you find the data you want. So imagine even something with a fairly fast transfer rate, how long it would take to read through 185 terabytes. Uh, of storage. It's not exactly convenient, but again, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to store something for the purposes of archival footage or making sure something is uh, kept preserved, that's not a bad way to go about it. If it's something that needs to be accessed regularly, it's a horrible idea. There are two different types of tapes. You can do what are called full-size data cartridges, look, look a little bit more like what you would consider a, a reel-to-reel. Uh, mini cartridges, which are much more popular since drives can fit in a three-inch drive bay. So that would be something that would fit in the front of your current uh, lab, your desktop tower. So, you know, iOmega used to have their, uh, their zip disk technology. That was very similar to a mini cartridge that you would use for a tape drive. Now, when you're selecting a tape drive, we want to know how many cartridges can it hold and what type does it use. We also want to be aware of how it interfaces with the machine. Now, because it is a mechanical interface, it's not going to be anywhere near as fast as we would expect for magnetics or solid states. 
here are some different types, uh, DTS, LTO, DLT, SDLT. What I want you to pay attention to on this slide is the size of the uh, DLT70 below the LG DVD-R uh, writable drive. It's not an RW, it's just a standard DVD writer drive. Um, and you'll notice that it, it's a big, big difference. But again, the internals are a lot more sturdy. Um, that drive down there is probably still running today. Um, probably in use by a business that does, you know, they have to log certain things, maybe financial transactions. Trayban uh, by iMation in this point uh, is a pretty common uh, tape storage. You can see the little red tab at the top to lock it so it can't be overwritten. AIT, SLR. SLR stands for Scalable Linear Recording. This is not to be confused with super long range for, uh, ca for cameras. SLR uh, is very similar to uh, those of you who might remember recording things on VHS. A uh, blank VHS cassette can be set to different play modes to where essentially a certain number of frames uh, would move at a particular speed. So you would have what was called SP, which is standard play, extended play, long play, and super long play. Um, SLP, you could get like a standard cassette to record for eight hours. But if you were doing it on SP, which definitely looked a lot cleaner, um, that would only record probably about 90 minutes to two hours. And then, of course, there are some other types of storage drives we might see, things like optical disks, USB flash drives, or memory cards. Um, one of my favorite things to include is the Apple II disk drive set, drives A and B. Uh, if you notice, that's one of the only times you'll ever see a B drive. That's why Windows started with drive C as its hard disk. It used to be that drive A was your operating system and drive B was any program that you were running. Um, hard disks didn't really become a thing initially with these machines. It was it was just the uh, the interfaces of the the disks being read to and from. DOS, uh, Microsoft's first operating system was disk operating system. MS DOS was Microsoft disk operating system, and it used the same principle. Now let's talk about RAID a little bit. RAID stands for redundant array of inexpensive or independent disks. Independent is probably the better term in modern era, simply because I've seen people make RAID clusters with four terabyte hard drives, which are not inexpensive by any means. It's a technology that configures two or more hard drives to work together as an array or group of drives. So why would we do this? Well, we want to improve performance by writing data to multiple drives, or we want to try and write multiple copies in order to prevent loss of data. Now, if you go on to a lot of different forums online, of course, there's a joke about how RAID is not a backup. And it's true, it's not, because it's local. Backups should be taken off-site in order to eliminate the possibility of the backup failing uh, due to a fire or something that would destroy both uh, drives in a RAID cluster if there was a, uh, a RAID 1 that was set up for mirroring. So let's talk about some different types of RAID. First one is gonna be spanning, sometimes called JBOD. So JBOD stands for just a bunch of disks. We take two hard drives and we join them together head to tail in order to hold a single Windows volume together. When one drive fills up, the data starts being written to the second drive. RAID 0 is going to use two or more disks in order to write uh, data evenly across the disks so that no one disk receives all of the activity. This is what we call striping. So let's say we have 100 kilobits of data that we have to write. If we have two disks, depending on the size of the stripe, let's say we do it as, you know, 32. We do 32 kilobits here, 32 kilobits there, and we bounce back and forth until we fill it all up. So no one drive does the majority of the data. Each of them gets around 500 kilobits of writing at that time. Mirroring RAID 1 is going to duplicate one drive uh, to another. So the data is written to drive 1, it's written to drive 2. RAID 5 uses three or more drives to stripe data and use what's called parity checking. So parity checking, if you'll remember from RAM, basically includes a bit or sequence of bits in order to verify the information on the two other drives in question. And data is not duplicated at this point. It's just um, for reduction of uh, wear and tear. RAID 10, uh, sometimes written to look like RAID 10. It is not RAID 10, so be careful that you don't fall into that trap. It's a combination of mirroring and striping. It takes at least four disks and data is mirrored across pairs. So let's look at this graphically. So we can see here with JBOD, we have the kind of, uh, you know, head to tail thing there. RAID 0, we can see the striping kind of moving across one to the other so that we're distributing the load. RAID 1, we can see the duplication. And RAID 5, we can see the parity check moving across the layers. Now RAID 1 and RAID 0, we can see kind of a combination here. 
we've got two pairs of mirror disks. So in this case, instead of having um, what we would say is like A1 and A2 mirroring each other and B1 and B2 mirroring each other, what we're going to do is distribute A1 and A2 as a striped cluster and then mirror A1 and A2 onto B1 and B2. Now, hardware RAID is considered the best. There's a lot of potential leaks and inconsistencies that can come about with software-based RAID. Um, RAID-enabled motherboards have to be present, so you have to make sure that you have a RAID-compatible system and that that mode is enabled in firmware. If not, you can get a RAID controller card if you don't have it on your motherboard directly. For best performance, all hard drives in an array should be identical in brand, size, speed, and other features. It just makes it more efficient. If Windows is going to be installed in a RAID system, we have to make sure that RAID is implemented before Windows is installed. Now, general directions to install a RAID 5 array using three matching SATA drives are shown below. Um, you guys did it in lab, so it's not something I'm necessarily going to bother you about in here. Um, but the idea is, is just like when you deal with uh, getting into UEFI, you're going to press Control i repeatedly to get in as opposed to F2 or F12 or delete or whatever key you've got there. Uh, sometimes the timer is very, very short, so you're going to want to make sure that you're spamming that key combination as soon as it starts to boot. Here we can see the uh, graphical representation of a RAID creation going on and the confirmation thereof. Now sometimes hard drives can be stored in external enclosures uh, and rather than joining them together, we just make them available as a network resource. So this is what's called a NAS or network attached storage. This is going to enclose several hard drives together and use an internal controller card to make them available over a network to all computers on said network that have the right permissions. So this is a Synology DS1511 Plus, has uh, five drive bays in it and can connect to uh, two LANs. Now there is an alternative to a storage like this called a SAN, which is a storage area network, but this is built on structured data rather than on the unstructured data, more like media. So when I say structured data, I mean that every record is the same size. It's great for things like databases. Now for external enclosures, we have to be aware that your firmware, of course, has to support um, whatever type of drive you're dealing with. Uh, you may have RAID support, you may not, so if you wish to use RAID with a drive enclosure, you want to make sure you check that ahead of time. If you're going to replace a hard drive in an enclosure, you should always check the documentation. Be aware that you're not violating the, uh, the warranty or not. If a computer case is overheating due to the drives that are present, you can always move some drives from the case to an external enclosure. Now, you don't want to do this with the drive that contains your Windows installation, because traditionally, a uh, USB connection or something similar for your enclosure is not going to be as fast as a standard SATA connection. You can also purchase a SATA controller card that provides external connectors or additional connectors, which is what I did. Now let's look at some other types of storage devices, optical disks, flash drives, and memory cards. So in order to manage data stored on a device, we implement what's called a file system. This is our overall structure that we use to name, store, and organize files through the operating system. In Windows, each storage device or group of devices, if we go through RAID, is assigned a drive letter and is called a volume. This process of adding a file system is called high-level formatting. So it's a callback to our low-level formatting we talked about with uh, the physical of the magnetic disk. Some different types of file systems you might see, NTFS, XFAT, FAT32, and standard FAT, FAT standing for File Allocation Table. CDFS and UDF are going to be used for our disks, compact disk file system, and universal disk format. Now, Blu-ray discs um, also use this uh, universal disk format. It's just a slightly newer version. So here we can see a 16 gig flash drive using FAT32. That is very common for portable flash storage. Compact discs, DVDs, and Blu-rays use similar laser technologies. What changes is the uh, what's called the pitch of the laser. And the way that you adjust the pitch of the laser is to use a finer and finer laser. So with CDs, they used red lasers. With DVDs, they used green. And with Blu-rays, they use an ultraviolet laser in order to um, make the, the focal point of the laser as precise as possible so that we can make the tiny uh, flat spots and pits on the surface able to be packed together much more tightly. So that represents the bits being read by the laser beam. With an optical disc, data can be written to one side of a CD, 
one or both sides of a DVD or Blu-ray, and DVDs and Blu-rays can hold multiple layers on each side. DVD can only hold two, uh, but Blu-ray, I believe they've gotten up to four. So here we can see a table that shows uh, some various storage capacities. Um, if you have curiosity about how to fill out that table for Lab 5, this is a handy one to look at, Figure 547. Now, for optical drives and burners, Blu-ray drives are backwards compatible with other technologies. They can um, have their laser system adjusted to be able to change focus and be able to burn information for DVDs and CDs. DVD drives are backwards compatible with CD technologies, and depending on the drive features, an optical drive may be able to handle all three. Today's internal optical drives interface via a SATA connection. Uh, an external drive may use USB or eSATA. And here's a little trick. USB is probably actually connecting to a SATA interface inside of your enclosure. So here we can see a Plextor PX610U. Uh, this one is a, a USB 2.0 portable drive. We can see if you look at the graphics on the front that it is a multi-format DVD reader and writer. It does CDs as well as rewritable discs. Uh, so this is one that's fairly, um, fairly portable, fairly inexpensive, a lot of them are. Um, good thing to have especially if you're doing uh, installations for a machine that may not have a optical disc already installed. Uh, you can plug that in via USB and use it to install Windows or possibly run some updates or things like that. Now, optical discs work by basically having places that are considered to be flat and reflective or places that are considered uh, less flat, maybe have like a little pit uh, that will catch a particular it, the substrate will actually catch the stylus or the laser or whatever it is that's trying to read the signal. So we can see here in the uh, graphic on the right that the laser, if it hits a flat spot, is going to read back a zero, meaning that the sensor is going to indicate that there is a, a zero present. We've got a continuity between one and zero. The pit is basically going to say the sensor is not catching, uh, so we're going to treat that as a one. There's the presence of a, a dent uh, or a, uh, a pit. So just like a gramophone, just like a, um, a, a vinyl record, you know, an 88 or uh, whatever you got, um, moving up to now we have CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays, there's going to be this um, reading of ridges and, and, and valleys. Now, multi-layer discs operate on the principle of a semi-transparent metal film. Um, you know, the first CD is used in aluminum alloy. Uh, DVD started using a semi-transparent gold alloy, and then we can see um, different types of reflector and semi-transparent reflectors, um, how we can do what's called BDXL, which is a four-layer Blu-ray disc. Now, installing an optical drive is pretty simple. Most of them have what are called generic drivers that don't require a specific add-on. For some systems, if we're dealing with a laptop, we're probably going to need to remove the keyboard. Uh, that's a little bit older. Most of them now, um, I know my wife's Dell, you can just literally take out one screw, slide out the drive, slide the new one in and put the screw back in. Some of them require that you, can, you know, disconnect cables and uh, all that stuff. As always, you're going to shut down the system, unplug the AC adapter and remove the battery pack. So you do not want there to be power coursing through your system while you're working on replacing these components, regardless of whether or not it's uh, one screw or, or five. So here we can see, in this case, the optical drive is a little bit more complexly packed away uh, than it would be in something that only has a, a single panel removal. Now, solid state storage is a very common piece of technology that we carry with us all the time. You know, pen drive, jump drive, flash drive, thumb drive, key drive, uh, any number of things. Embedded drivers have been presented since Windows 7 to support flash drives automatically. Sometimes you'll see what's called a USB mass storage or USB portable storage driver. Memory cards are very similar, except instead of having a direct USB interface to the computer, they go through some kind of intermediary device, um, such as a reader, or they might be in the actual device they use to record information, so the digital camera, smartphone, etc. Secure Digital, SD, is a, uh, the most common memory card standard right now, and there are three substandards for each. Version 1 is regular, version 2 is high capacity, and version 3 is extended capacity. Um, and they're backwards compatible, so that means that an extended capacity can work in a high capacity slot or a regular, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you can't do them forwards to where you can't use an extended capacity in a regular slot. The standard uh, secure digital as well as the high capacity use the FAT file system, 
extended capacity uses the XFAT file system. Uh, that's part of how they organize things to use the same physical space to store more information. So here we can see some different versions of flash memory cards. Now let's talk a little bit about troubleshooting before we close up for the evening. Most of the time when we're dealing with hard drives, we have to establish whether or not the problem is based on software on the actual drive itself, you know, the, the uh, information that's encoded. Is it the files uh, on the drive, the file system have a corruption, or is it the actual physical hardware of the subsystem itself? Uh, now, if we're trying to solve a problem with the boot, we need to isolate whether or not it's hardware or software. So how do we do that? Well, let's say that the computer is running slowly. The overall performance of a system depends on our core components, processor, motherboard, memory, and then, of course, the hard drive. We can uh, optimize a drive by saying, okay, let's go ahead and defrag it. Defragmentation is the process of taking all the little bits of files that are spread out across a drive as it's written to and deleted from and trying to put blocks of files as close together as possible. Uh, you can also do what's called trimming on an SSD, and that's very close to what we talked about with garbage collection before, where we consolidate things onto pages and try and compress it down so that pages are being used optimally. Here we can see the, uh, the optimization system for Windows uh, Disk Defragmenter. We can see that um, two of the drives have already been set in OK status. Uh, the solid state drive has been trimmed and volume D is not fragmented, but volume F and the system reserved partitions uh, have not been optimized and need to be done. So if we're looking for hardware problems, they're usually going to show up at post. If firmware can't access the drive, the cause could be the drive itself, uh, the data cable being loose or damaged, the electrical system, the motherboard. Uh, things to do before we open the case, and this is again, before we open the case, this is purely external. Check to see if you're getting an error code. Check to see if you're getting any post beeps. Um, check firmware for any errors in the configuration. Try booting from something like a USB or optical disk. If you have a RAID array, the RAID utility will often allow you to check the status of each disk in the array to see if anything looks unusual. If the problem is still not solved, let's go ahead and pop the case open and take a look. Um, reseat all your cables. Reseat your controller card if you have one. Check the drive for damage. Uh, check your cables. Listen to see if your hard drive is actually spinning. I prefer to take, as long as I have my grounding cable on, I put two fingers on the top of the surface and you can feel uh, when the drive is spinning up. Now there's just kind of the, the whir of it trying to spin and not clicking through. Uh, and then when it really gets moving, you know, the full 5400 or 7200 RPM, um, you can really feel that vibration. And then of course you can look for smart errors. Uh, there's some different Windows tools such as startup repair, check disk, uh, the check disk command, especially if you use the slash R flag, um, you can go ahead and use the repair uh, request there. The problem is still not solved from there. Then we can go through what's called the boot rec uh, repair. So we can repair the boot configuration, the boot sector, and the master boot record by using these three commands. Boot rec slash rebuild BCD slash fix boot and slash fix MBR. Um, you guys probably have seen me do that once or twice with a uh, USB based Windows installed to try and fix a potential problem. Check your manufacturer's website for diagnostic software. Move the device to a working computer and install it as a second drive. That will sometimes uh, help you fix the issue because if you're loading it as an operating system there may be certain files that are corrupted uh, and you can repair those by installing it as a second drive on another machine. If you need to get a fresh start, of course, you can start over by formatting the volume, uh, and then disk part is probably my favorite. I'll go ahead and do uh, list disk, and then I'll select whichever disk it is that I need. So let's say select disk zero, uh, and then I'll type in clean, convert GPT, and then I'll go ahead and set my, you know, my, uh, my file system as well as the name for my volume, and that'll get it nice and polished up for me. There are also some what are called zero sector formats that you can use that'll check every single sector, things like that. Uh, that's much more extensive than most of us would use, but if you're having a drive that's consistently giving you problems, that might not be a bad, uh, bad idea. We can also change out the three FRUs, field replaceable units, the data cable, the storage card, and the hard drive. So the data cable, of course, you know, that's pretty easy to switch out. Um, the storage card, that's pretty much the interface between the uh, drive and the motherboard or a controller card if you have it and then the hard drive itself um, It gets kind of dicey when you start replacing like the actual motherboard, uh, but I have seen it done 
Um, power supply could be problematic. Maybe you have a bad connector. I always recommend checking your power supply if you're having issues, especially after you're adding a hard drive, not replacing, but adding. Um, you know, hard drives need power too. So my, my home file server, you know, it's got eight drives in it. So if we assume 20 to 30 watts per drive, that's 240 before we even get into the 30% rule. Now we get into our chapter summary. I obviously won't insult you by reading it to you, but it is a convenient way to go over the content of the chapter very, very quickly, especially because it's kind of in order. So if you see a topic you need to jump back to, you can do so. Uh, so of course, if you have any questions or concerns, you can always contact me via email at jearmke063 at cfcc.edu, or you can uh, give me a text at my Google Voice number 2397814. Other than that, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and I will see you next class.